Good morning, Liberty. Stand with us if you would. Let's invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to meet with us today. Father in heaven, we love you and we're so grateful for your love for us. We're so thankful for the privilege to meet in your house to worship you as a church. Father, no matter what needs are represented today, Father, we cast all of our cares upon you for you care for us. Father, we've come into this place and now we're going to lift up our voices. We're going to sing and worship you through music. Lord, we ask that you would be pleased with our worship, with our sacrifice of praise. And Father, that as your word goes forth in just a moment, that you would speak to us. That you would change us to be more like your son, Jesus. Sanctify us through your word, through the truth of your word, Father. Draw us closer to you. We love you and we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for this day. And we look to you for great things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Well, let's worship this morning. This is where all my striving seems. 
was buried beneath my shame. It was my dream till I met you. Well, I was breathing, but not alive. And all my failures, I tried to hide. It was my Till I met you, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. are awake. Y'all are singing out. Everybody raising their hands, smiles on your faces. It's a good day to be in God's house. Amen. A great day to be at Liberty Baptist Church. We're so glad, members, that you're here, that you're faithful. I see some uh, some visitors throughout the crowd. We're so thankful that you chose to worship with us today. We're going to have a great day. We're here. God's presence is here, and that's all you need for a great day great service. Amen. So God's going to do great things in this place, and I'm just excited to be here and to be part of it. All right, this is uh, next to the last Sunday, so you got one more Sunday after today if you haven't memorized your verse yet. But hopefully you have. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, this is our church verse. Let's say it together. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. There's freedom, there's power, where the Spirit of the Lord is, and He is in this place today. And I am so 
grateful that you're here as well. But if you're glad to be in God's house today, tell someone you're glad to see him. Amen? You may be seated. We'll continue worshiping our Lord this morning. Amen.
eternity.
You can imagine that moment in heaven when we first get there and we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, what it is that we'll desire more than anything. And I think that song sums it up pretty well, what we'll need to do and what we'll want to do. Crown him Lord of all. Amen. The Bible says in that day our faith will be sight. All the things that we've imagined and wondered will be blown away with something so much greater, so much better, so much higher than anything we could possibly think. Heaven will be wonderful. Amen. I invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Mark, chapter 14. Thank you so much for being here. We continue our series this morning. We're going through the Bible and we're identifying different people, both men and women, characters in the Scripture. And we're just doing one message on each character, uh, no doubt, as we study the lives of different uh, people in the Scripture, we could do a whole series just on one person, and I have uh, throughout the years. But what we're wanting to do is just bring out uh, some of the more obscure people and, and preach one message about each of them. So Mark chapter 14, uh, this week has been an, a really good week, an exciting week, uh, my nephew and niece uh, gave birth to a, well, not my nephew, but my niece gave birth to a baby girl this week. Her name is Chloe uh, Louise. Louise is my mother-in-law's middle name, and I've got a wonderful mother-in-law, sweet lady. And also, uh, Brother Miss uh, Bush, they had a granddaughter this week. Uh, is it uh, Emmy? Ellie. 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 Ara Joy. Okay, so there's three names there. So I got you. All right. And uh, I saw pictures of, of both these little girls, beautiful, 
beautiful uh, little girls. And so congratulations uh, to uh, uh, Brother Miss Bush and Franklin and Brooke. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was thinking this week about my niece's um, uh, little girl and Chloe. I've always liked that name, Chloe. And, uh, of course, Louise, as I said, is, is my mother-in-law's middle name. And I, I think as we name kids, and I've talked about this over the years before, it's a reflection of the parents' love and hope for their children. And uh, parents give their children names sometimes to, in their mind uh, because this is a special gift from God. You know what? And that's what babies are. They are a joy at least for a little while, well, they're little still. When they get to be teenagers, maybe not. But uh, no, the truth is, children are a heritage of the Lord, the Bible says, and, and the man that has many of them is truly blessed. And so we could say that uh, names that parents give their children uh, signifies the parents' love. And I think when we come to this chapter in the Bible this morning, the parents of Judas probably felt the same way when they named him because the name Judas means praise. And so I thought, as I was thinking about this and preparing the message, as they looked at that little baby boy and, and they gave him that name, they named him that because they were praising God for the wonderful blessing of having a son. And, uh, and I thought about that and I thought, my, how things can change. Because no time in my life have I ever met a, a, a set of parents that named their little boy Judas. Judas. Since this Judas in the scripture, I, I, I've never, I know there were several in the scripture uh, and in that ancient time, they, they used that name. But since then, since Judas acts in his life story, I've never met somebody named Judas. I, I've, I, I think about uh, uh, little girls when they're born and, and, I, and I've never known uh, a, a little girl that the mom and dad looked at her and said, you know what, we just want to name her Jezebel. Now, I've known some women that got called Jezebel, you know, by some men, but I've never, I've never met a little girl named Jezebel. And again, I've never met a little boy named Judas. I've never had somebody come up to me, oh, pastor, you got to see our new baby boy. Well, what'd you name him? Judas. I've never, I've never had that happen. Uh, Judas was the betrayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this message this morning is going to be a little more serious, uh, a little more... Uh, intense, I suppose, than some of these messages in this series, this series have been. And I, I want you to really pay attention this morning because Judas did, I think, probably the most ungodly act in all of history when he betrayed the Lord Jesus the way that he did. And people have tried to rehabilitate him as these historical revisionists have done. They've tried to rewrite history. They've tried to say that, well, Judas was just kind of a victim of the circumstances and, and he was kind of misled. And, and uh, the Jews, of course, was looking for a king that would conquer and kill, that would, would rout their enemies, that would defeat Rome, who was uh, in control of Israel at that time. And, and maybe people uh, think that, you know, he got a bum deal because Jesus was not that. And, and I know some commentators, these liberal commentators, have said something like, uh, well, Judas was trying to force the Lord Jesus' hand. And in betraying him and in doing that, Jesus would respond uh, aggressively and Jesus would defeat the enemies and that would be that. And these liberal commentators have written that, but can I just tell you, that's a bunch of hogwash. The Bible tells us that the devil was in Judas. And one of the most Intimate greetings that a, that a man could give another man in ancient times. We don't do it today, but it, in some cultures they do. With a kiss, he betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ for money's sake. The Bible says that for 30 pieces of silver, he betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we think about Judas, it was not uh, to benefit Israel. It was not to help Jesus uh, do what God intended for him to do. He did it for money's sake. He betrayed him. So why is Judas in the Bible? I think the Lord Jesus, the author of the Word, He is the incarnate Word, but also the triune God, the Holy Spirit, led these men to write the Holy Scriptures. And, and I believe that Judas is in the Scripture for one reason, and that is so that God can give you and I this morning a warning in the Scripture. 
Judas, uh, Judas is a warning of some, for some people sitting here perhaps even this morning. For some person that's perhaps even playing church today, he's a stop sign on the road to hell is what he is. A flashing stop sign. I know you've all seen them. The, the typical stop sign is just a red sign that says stop. And when you see red, that's warning stop. But when they put lights around it and it flashes, it means you better stop. This is very dangerous. You better be careful. You see, folks, it's possible to be religious. It's possible to attend religious services. And it's possible to know religious language, I believe. It's possible to be consumed, immersed, and even baptized in religion and yet still die and go straight to hell. And so this morning, I want you to, some note, to notice some things about this stop sign named Judas. If you would look in your Bibles, Mark chapter 14, and we'll begin reading in verse number 10. And it says, And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priest to betray him, Jesus, unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might uh, conveniently betray him, how he would easily do it. And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples uh, said unto him, uh, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And whosoever he shall uh, go in, or wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house, The master saith, Where is this uh, guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve. And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, now notice this, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and say unto him, One by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in this dish. The Son of Man indeed goeth, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it, notice this, for that man if he had never been born. I want you to notice three things with me this morning, but before we do, allow me to pray with you again. Our Father in heaven, as we come before you, we ask, Father, that you would take total control of this message. Fill my mind with your thoughts, my mouth with your words. Move me out of the way, and Father, may the cross stand in front of me. And Father, may all the glory for anything done today go to you. We take nothing for ourselves except a, a lesson, a message that we apply to the needs of our life. And Father, there's a lesson to learn this morning from Judas an unlikely character in the Scripture, a man that did something horrible, and yet he's recorded in Holy Writ, and you said of those recorded in the Scripture, it was given to us as our example, what we should do and what we should not do. And so, Father, help us take away from the Word of God this morning that which you would have us to. If there's someone under the sound of my voice, Father, that, that they're just going through the motions of religion, they do not have a relationship with Christ. I pray, Father, today that they would be saved before it's eternally too late. And when the invitation is given, they would make that move to accept you, if not even before then, that they would receive you today. And for those that are saved this morning, Lord, that we would evaluate our lives. We would, as you said in the Scripture, examine ourselves to see that we are truly in the faith and of the faith. And Father, help nobody to leave here today having rejected your word. And again, we'll give you the glory for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Now, as we consider this stop sign I've named uh, here, the stop sign Judas, I want you to notice three things. Notice, first of all, his disguise. 
He had religious activity. And we see there in the scripture, first of all, he enjoyed a a religious position. Notice verse number 10. Notice what it says right there. And think of all the spiritual opportunities that Judas had as we consider the scripture. And verse 10 says, And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve. He occupied a position of great influence. He was one of Jesus' disciples, one of His apostles, one of the the inner group, the twelve that followed after the Lord Jesus. An apostle of Jesus Christ was only for a certain time. It was someone that must have seen the Lord Jesus Christ. And it would be those that when Jesus said, follow me, that left it all and followed Him, committed completely to Him. They were a part of a very exclusive group. So we notice that uh, Judas had a religious position. But can I just tell you this this morning? You can have pastor in front of your name and still die and go to hell. You can have evangelist in front of your name and still die and go to hell. You can have deacon in front of your name and still die and go to hell. You can have Sunday school teacher and praise team member and, and congregation member and faithful servant of the church attached to your name and still die and go to hell. Why? See, God does not allow people into heaven based on their religious position. People go to heaven because they've come to the foot of an old rugged cross and received the Lord Jesus Christ and the free pardon of sin, amen? People uh, come into heaven because they've set aside their self-righteousness and their ability and what they can do and they put their faith and trust only and completely in what Jesus Christ has done. For by grace you save through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest Any man should boast, amen? There will be no boasting in heaven because it's nothing that we've done that will get us into heaven. It's just what Jesus did. If it was by my good works, if it was by something I could do, I could get into heaven and say, hey, everybody, look at me. Look what I accomplished. But there will be no glory except in the Lord Jesus Christ when we get into heaven. But understand this morning, sitting perhaps under the sound of my voice are those folks that occupy religious positions. Maybe they've been a long-time member. Maybe they've been baptized. Maybe they work uh, in ministries. And yet, the Bible says that at the judgment seat of Christ, they'll stand before Almighty God. And He will say to many, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. See, they occupied religious position, but they did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Notice not only did he enjoy religious position, but he enjoyed religious privileges. And again, we go back to verse number 10, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve. Now think of the privileges that Judas, uh, that he received. He got to see and do things that Moses and Joshua and David never did. He got to sit and eat with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Glory. He got to hear Jesus sing songs. They never got that. When his, with his own eyes, he got to view the miracles that Jesus did when he raised Lazarus from the dead, when he caused a, a, a blind man to see and a lame man to walk and the demon possessed to be healed and the devils depart from them. Abraham never got to hear the Lord Jesus preach. Moses never got to see the Lord Jesus do miracles. David never got to sit in Jesus' presence as he sang. And yet Judas had all these religious privileges. Privileges of an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet he died and went to hell. Now I think about the privileges that each of us have this morning. Are you with me here this morning? We get to come to this church. Now this is not a perfect church and we all know that. And I'd be the first to admit it, but I'll tell you what, this church believes the Bible is the infallible, inspired Word of Almighty God. And this church right here believes that the only way to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing else. While some may not like the way we do the music and may, while some may not like the way I preach the message, I'll tell you one thing, from the praise team to my staff and to this pulpit, We all know that there's only one way to heaven and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ and His shed blood. Amen? He's not a way. He's not a good way. And He's not one of many ways. He is the only way. Oprah said there can't be just one way. And I tell you, but the Bible says there is just one way. And Jesus said it Himself in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by Me. So it's by the way of the blood-stained cross that you and I come to the Lord Jesus Christ and one day we'll enter heaven because of that way and no other way. Amen? 
That's preached Sunday mornings. It's preached Wednesday nights. It's preached in our youth. It's preached in our king's kids. And it's sung from our praise team. Amen? That's what we believe as a church. And so we think about all the, the religious privileges that you and I have. So Judas, he enjoyed a religious position. He enjoyed religious privileges. But notice also, he had a religious personality. Have you ever met people that are just naturally religious? Uh, you know, they're very pious. They carry themselves in such a way. And, and there's, there, there's a, a time when, uh, when there's small talk, and it's okay to talk about some things other than Jesus. It's okay to talk about our family. It's okay to talk about Harley Davison's. It's okay to talk about uh, uh, a good song on the, on the radio. It's okay to talk about a decent TV show that's come out. Now listen, the priority of our life should be the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? But it's okay. God has given us good things that we can enjoy in this life, from our family to our jobs and to uh, even the blessings of our home and our cars. Those are blessings, and it's okay to enjoy those things. But you've met some people... You try to just enjoy and relax and, and they've got a, you know, and, and they put it on. They put it on. They get all stiff-necked and, and, and it makes you uncomfortable because they've got a religious personality. Jesus was very specific. He said, one of the twelve that is sitting here is going to be the one that betrays me. Now the Bible does not say that the, apostle begin to, the apostles begin to say, I know who it is. Now, if that happened this morning, Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, we might be going, mm, yeah, I know who that's going to be, you know. The apostles didn't do that. And instead, the Bible says that they begin, and notice verse number 19, and they began to be sorrowful and to say uh, unto him one by one, is it I? No one imagined that Judas would be the one. Why? He had a religious personality. No one ever expected him. They, they would travel the roads of that ancient country. Together they had sat there under the teaching of Jesus together. And no one expected that Judas would be capable of doing what he did when he betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. I think about as we look at this congregation this morning as I look over the congregation and, 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 and we look at each other if we were to do that. No one could imagine that maybe raging in someone's heart this morning is a battle, an eternal battle, to either accept or reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and they're, they're perhaps very religious. And yet, they'll leave here today and, and that's about... All they have to do with Jesus. Now when confronted and are put in a situation to talk about religion or church or the Bible, yeah, they, they, they know the lingo. They've been around it so long and, and, and maybe they even profess, you know, yeah, I'm saved. Religious personality. We could never imagine that maybe somebody here this morning is a church member or a Sunday school teacher or a deacon. It's never been saved. What happened? They've disguised it very well. And that's what Judas did. See, in our hearts, each and every one of us, we really know who we are and what we are. We might not admit it, but we know. And more importantly, God knows. So what do we do when we come to a place like this? We, we, we put on our disguise. We, we've gotten so good at doing it, perhaps, that we don't even realize we're doing it anymore, but we do. Not only did he enjoy position and privileges and personality, but he enjoyed a religious profession. How did, how did Judas get to be an apostle? Have you ever thought about that? Someone capable of doing what he did. and How did he get to be? Well, the Lord Jesus walked those streets of Galilee, and, and, and I think just like he came to those that were fishing that day, and he said, hey, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they laid their nets aside, and they followed Jesus. And that was not just, a, you know what, a changing of jobs. What that was was, you know what? I believe in him. 
I trust Him. He's the Messiah. And they left that and they followed Him. I think of Matthew. He was a tax collector. And of course, we all love tax collectors. Amen. He was a tax collector and, and he was sitting at the table and Jesus said, uh, came to him. He said, follow me. And he got up from his table and he followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Somewhere along the way, there's Jesus and there's Judas. And Jesus made an offer. Follow me. And he did. He did. He stepped out and he, he publicly, publicly professed by doing that, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now understand, he enjoyed religious position and privileges and personality and a religious profession. And yet he was lost and died and went to hell. How? Why? It was all just a disguise. He was playing church. But notice the second thing, not only his disguise, but his depravity. I want us to look as best as we can at the heart of Judas because when, when God looks at you and I, he's not looking on the outside, he's looking on the inside. You know, the best we can do is look at each other and go, yeah, I, I think he's probably saved or she's probably saved. But the truth is, the Bible says man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And I mean, really, what does a saved man look like? Is it wearing... Uh, the robes of a rabbi? Is it wearing a, 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 a suit and a tie? Uh, I, I mean, what does it look like? Is it dressing like Jesus did in ancient times? The truth is, we don't know. Because we can't look at the heart. But as best we can, I want to look at the heart of Judas. Because when we look inside and what we do, we begin to peel back all the religion. We begin to pull back the layers of... You, you know, some people uh, say... Things like when you talk to them, do you, do you know the Lord Jesus? And they'll go, and, 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 and Pastor Reed used to testify this. Uh, one man, one time he met a man, he said, uh, are you saved? And he said, and he pulled out his veterans card and said, I'm an American. Okay. I didn't ask you about where your citizenship was. I asked you, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? But some people, they have a layer. And it might be that someone would say, well, you know what? I've taught Sunday school for 30 years. I've been a deacon for 10 years. It might be that, well, my mom and dad or my grandma and grandpa. I want you to see when we look at the inside of Judas, we want to peel back all the religion and notice the disguise that he wore. The first thing we notice about Judas is that, number one, he was crooked. He was a common thief. That's what the Bible tells us. Last year I preached a message. Remember about Mary when she came to Jesus and they're in the room and she gets that alabaster box of precious ointment. It would be like to you ladies today, uh, except, well, I can't even really give you a good illustration because perfume and cologne is very expensive, but it didn't compare to the price they would have to pay for it back then. Like a bottle of Chanel or something like that is expensive. Uh, I need to buy some cologne right now. I'm, I'm out, but the polo I like is like $65 a bottle. It lasts a long time, but I don't want to spend 65 bucks on cologne. So I just spray, uh, you know, insect repellent on it. It kind of smells the same, you know, you never know. Uh, mix it with a little honey or something, I don't know. But anyway, I, I preached that message, and she, uh, she broke that alabaster box and anointed the Lord Jesus with that oil and that perfume. And the Bible says, as we evaluate the expense and compare it, it was the equivalent of a year's salary, uh, what she did. And, and, and the, the backdrop of this story is that when she did that, and of course the Lord Jesus allowed her to do it, the Lord Jesus did not rebuke her for doing it, but there was a lot of people that began to criticize her for doing that. And, 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 and John tells us who led the charge. Who was it? It was Judas. Can I tell you that Criticism is a contagious thing. See, what you've got, you, you've got uh, this one person that gets bent out of shape and then they get in a position where they poison everybody around them. And I don't know if you figured this out yet. If you find somebody that will talk about someone else to you, guess what? They'll talk about you to someone else. I know people talk about me and I know people talk about my wife and my sons. Why? I'm the pastor. 
Well, I'm just sure he's just not all that, you know. Well, put up a camera in my house, you'll see all that. Because what you see here is what you get there. Same thing. We're the same people. People criticize. And, you know, Jesus said they did it to him, so I guess you're in good company when they criticize you. In fact, in the Beatitudes, it said, Blessed are you when men shall persecute you for my name's sake. So, you know what? Happy. You can get happy when people are on you because you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, no doubt, I'm not perfect. President Trump's not perfect. I'll tell you what, he's an easy target, isn't he? People criticize. Well, the person that led the criticism of Mary was Judas. And the Bible tells us in John chapter 12 and verse number 6, he didn't do it because he cared. Because what what was said was, you shouldn't have done that. Uh, We could have sold that. Oh, okay, newsflash here. First of all, it wasn't yours to sell. It was hers, so butt out, right? It was hers, and it was her possession, and what she did was an act of worship on Jesus. She did it. It wasn't a group think. It wasn't like, well, what do y'all all think about it? Nobody asked them. They just volunteered. Isn't that the way critical people are? Nobody asked you. My mom used to say that. Nobody asked you for your opinion. (laughs) Okay. But Judas led the charge. We could have sold that and we could have given it to the poor. Notice how he says we, we, we when it's a good positive thing. But it was you, you, you when they portrayed it as being a bad thing. So Judas got everybody worked up criticizing the woman. And here's the thing. It didn't... Listen. He wasn't concerned about the poor. He didn't give a rip about starving children over in Africa. He wanted to control the money. He was a thief and he was a lover of money. And so Judas got all this religion on the outside, but on the inside, he's lost. Why? Because religion don't change you. It doesn't change your values and it doesn't change your nature. And here's the thing, uh, because if you're not saved, the Bible says you're dead in trespasses and sin, and that's what you do. Because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, a new creature. Old things pass away, all things become new. You don't get a new, uh, or turn over a new leaf. You get a new life when you come to Jesus. Amen? You know, what you need is not rededication. It's not reformation. It's not revival. What some people need is resurrection. Amen? They need a new life. See, before you can be revived, you've got to first and foremost have been vibed at some point, right? So what do we see here? Judas was crooked. But notice, secondly, he was covetous. He loved money, and so money was his God. And we certainly see example after example of that in the Scripture. The rich young ruler came to Jesus. Hey, good master, you know, why do you call me good? There's none good but God, Jesus said. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. He went away sorrowful because he had great goods, great wealth, the Bible says. So he kept all the Ten Commandments, he said. He did all these things. And yet the first commandment, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul and all thy mind. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You you get the drift. What What kept him from coming to Jesus, really? It was his money. Go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. By the way, when you do that, you'll have treasure in heaven. He couldn't do it went away sorrowful. And so it was with Judas. Listen, if if Jesus Christ is not your God, then something else is your God. And someone said this, if Jesus is not Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. See, He won't play second fiddle. He's not going to get in your minivan and ride in the back seat while you drive. He's not going to be the co-pilot as people have put on the bumper stickers. He's either the pilot or He's not in the plane. The Bible says that Judas went to those religious people who were plotting to kill Jesus and he he came up with a convenient, easy way and for money's sake. Notice verse 11, Mark 14, 11. It says, and when they heard it, they were glad and they promised to give him the money. So he was crooked, he was covetous. Notice thirdly that he was counterfeit. A hypocrite, and let me just say this. There are times that we all can be hypocritical, okay? Okay but a hypocrite in the sense that I'm talking about now is someone that professes to be a Christian and is not a Christian and they know it, okay? 
They put on. That's a hypocrite. Now, we all sometimes say one thing and do another thing. Paul said he was that. He did that. The things he shouldn't do, he did, and the things he should do, he didn't do. You know what? When you, when you preach certain things, that's why Paul said later, I bring my body under subjection, lest after I preach, I myself become a castaway. Uh, it, it, it's easy to say something, and, and, and then it's hard sometimes to follow through, and that makes us all hypocrites at one time or another. I heard somebody say, well, I won't go to that church because it's full of hypocrites. You're right. But I'm going to tell you what, if you let a hypocrite get between you and God, they're closer to God than you are. So you don't come to church or not come to church because of hypocrites. They're everywhere. What Judas was doing was play acting. And, and I see it glaringly clear in two things. I want you to notice, first of all, it was glaringly clear. And I'm talking about he was, how he was a counterfeit and how that he expressed concern for the poor. The only poor he was concerned about was his own poor self, okay? And I already said that a while ago. But what he was doing was a sham. The point he was making over Mary anointing Jesus, that was a sham. That was a phony mask that he was wearing. Talking about the poor, he was just trying to be spiritual. That was not the case, as we all know. He sounded spiritual. The problem was he wasn't spiritual. Secondly was how he approached the Lord Jesus Christ. He betrayed the Lord with a kiss. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's, there's been throughout my life, and I'm sure you've experienced it as well, people that you let into your inner circle that betray you. And it makes it very difficult to trust when you've been violated like that by somebody. It makes it very difficult to trust and to open up. There's, there's no greater sign of friendship and love in ancient times than that kiss. He didn't have to do that. He could have simply pointed Jesus out. Instead, he went and gave him a kiss, a greeting. And that, that greeting was a show of respect. It was a show of love. It was a show of devotion. And then immediately, he did all of that in betrayal. What I've endured still, if I think about it, 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 it can bring me to tears and hurt. I cannot imagine what Jesus felt at the hands of Judas. Later that night when they came to arrest him, he said, Master, which means teacher. What he was saying when he said that is, I'm a follower of your teaching, Jesus. What he was saying is, I like your preaching. And then he turned and betrayed him. What a fake. What a counterfeit. What a hypocrite. And then he acts like he loves Jesus. What was it? It was just play acting. And I don't know that anybody here, because I, I, I know you, and if you're visiting with us, uh, I, I prefaced at the beginning, this is going to be a little different message. I don't know anybody here that I know that would blatantly and maliciously do what Judas did. But can I tell you, it's possible to, to do it anyway. Because to reject Christ comes by default. We're automatically wired as lost. And when confronted with the message, confronted with the Word of God, we've got a choice to say, you know what, I accept that. And in accepting that, I accept Him. And, and it's not, it's a one-time thing for salvation, but it's a thing that we do over and over again as we come to worship, as we come to church. We hear the Word of God preached, and we say, I accept that, or I reject that. And it doesn't matter if we profess salvation. If we reject that, it essentially it is rejecting Him because it's His work. Sitting in church this morning, it's possible that there are people that can talk spiritual, act spiritual, look spiritual, and yet they are play-acting. Maybe they're fooling their own, their own selves. But in their heart, they know that they're lost. And the, the sad 
thing is, that makes them just like Judas. Now, I'm not God, and I'm not your judge. But the Bible says, by their fruits, you shall know them. You can know a false prophet by their fruits, what they're teaching, what they're doing. They're everywhere out there. But the truth is, you can also find and know a false Christian or a false believer by their fruits. The Bible says there are those that walk in the flesh, and they're after the flesh. And there's those that walk in the spirit. Now, all of us are capable of having a bad day and messing up and making mistakes. Amen? That's me, that's you, that's all of us. But for the child of God, the pattern of our life is going to be we're following Christ. Amen? And we're walking after Him. And if we can't say that, if we, if we see the pattern of our life is spent more doing other things than, than following Christ, then we've got a problem. And that leads me to the last point. We see His disguise, we see His depravity, and by the way, uh, we, we are all depraved, okay? It's easy to look at the pervert uh, on the news and say, you know what, that's depravity right there, but the truth is we are all depraved. And our flesh left to itself is capable of anything apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice one more thing about old Judas. Notice his destiny. And listen to what I'm saying this morning because I'm afraid maybe somebody listening under the sound of my voice this morning and I prayed and I struggled with this message and I asked God to take charge of it. But the truth is, maybe somebody's under conviction right now and the invitation is going to come and like Judas, who was confronted time and time again with the message of Jesus Christ, and opportunity after opportunity, he rejected, and someone this morning is going to reject that opportunity. Folks, I want you to understand what your destiny is. You say, Pastor, what happened to Judas Iscariot? And we're going to look at it in the Scripture, because the Bible says that he watched the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ. And... and Knowing who Jesus was and what Jesus did, how could you not like him? I mean, he was nice to everybody. The downers and outers, the outcasts, the poor, the hurting, the sick, the lepers, people, people couldn't even, in that Jewish culture, couldn't even get close to a leper. In fact, the leper by law was required to say, unclean, unclean, in other words, stay away from me. And yet Jesus went right to them and healed them and loved them. How could anybody want to do something horrible to Jesus? The Bible says that after Judas watched the trial in Matthew 27, 3, that it says he repented. But I want you to understand the word used in repentance there, it, it doesn't mean that he repented in that he agreed with Christ and made a turn, a 180. It means that he felt remorse. He, he, he looked at what was going on. I mean, here's Jesus, the sinless Son of God, who had, who had said nothing bad, who had done nothing bad, and people are punching Him in the face and spitting on Him and stripping Him naked and beating Him. And then they, you know, He knows what's coming. They're going to go hang Him on a cross. And He was familiar with Roman crucifixion. They had seen it probably, you know, uh, many times had He seen it. And now all of a sudden He's like, oh, man. I might have made a mistake. I might have messed up. Judas felt bad. He tried to give the money back, the Bible says, but it was too late. He repented, but it was not unto salvation. And you know someone here this morning, maybe as you're confronted with the choices of your life, you feel bad and you say, uh, Pastor Rick, I, I, I'm going to try to do better, but that's not what you need, my friend. You're not going to heaven because you can do better. You cannot do better, the truth is. You need the Lord Jesus Christ in you, amen? He tried to give the money back. That, what did he try? Rededication, reformation. The Bible says in despair, what did Judas do? Judas went out and hung himself. That was the weight of guilt. I want to show you the destiny of a person who's religious but lost. Acts chapter 1 and verse 18. I want you to turn there real quick. Unless you think I'm being a little hard or maybe a little 
graphic, I want you to see what the Bible says about old Judas, the man who was religious but lost. It says in the latter part of verse 18, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. Now, I'm going to tell you something, that's pretty gross right there. This is what the Bible tells us. Judas did not have the Lord Jesus Christ in his heart. And when you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, you can go to a place the Bible calls as being hopeless. And hopelessness, in Judah's case, led to condemnation. The Bible says that if you're in Christ, you're, there, there is no condemnation. And yet, if you're not in Christ, you are condemned. It's not that one day you will be condemned, it's that you're condemned already. Just as sure as the people at Huntsville on death row are condemned and will one day pay the price with their life, the Bible says those that are lost are in and under condemnation right now. And so what did Judas uh, do with the load of that guilt and the condemnation? He went out and hung himself. And I'm telling you this morning, folks, that's what the load of guilt and condemnation will do. Religion cannot take that off of you. See, you don't need your sin covered by religion. You need to be forgiven, amen? And so Jesus doesn't say, clean yourself up and come to me. Try to do better and then come to me. What Jesus says, you come to me with all the muck and the mud and the mire and the the dirt under your fingernails and the slime of sin all over you and I'll take you in my arms and I will lovingly bathe you in the blood that I shed for you and wash you whiter than snow. That's what people need today. That's what Judas needed, but that's not what he got. Based on the book of Acts, we can deduct these truths. Evidently, what happened to Judas was he went out alone, and he hung himself alone, and he hung there many days alone. And his body began to bloat, and I'll spare you all the the details, but basically the rope gave way, and he fell And because of the decay of the body and the situation that his body had fallen into in the sun and there many days, the Bible says that everything gushed out. You say, Pastor, where does religion take you? Right there. That's it. You say, well, Pastor, I'm not like Judas. I'm not covetous. I'm not jealous. I'm not hypocritical. I'm not believing. I'm not... not, uh, you know, just religious. But folks, that's the shape that we're all in until we meet the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all of us until we come to faith in Christ. I was raised in church. I knew Bible. I would graduated from Liberty Baptist Christian School. Been here from the time I was 12 years old, the summer of my sixth grade year, all the way up. And managed to get all of that in my, in, my, in my life and all of that influence and all of that and still get out of this place unsaved. Until July 26, 1992. And I know what it's, I know what it's like to be a church member that's religious but lost. And I got to tell you, I had a false hope, a false confession. I didn't intend to, but that's what I had. And I know Brother Copeland can give the same testimony. He was saved in in seminary. That's a good place to get saved, right? Maybe somebody here this morning, you've been here many, many years, and yet you're still unsaved. Maybe you struggle with it when confronted. Maybe you've come home and Everybody's gone, and you wonder, did the rapture take place, and I somehow get left behind, and you're fearful. But the Bible says where there's real faith, there's no fear. There's no need to fear. There's no need to even fear death, because if you're saved, you've got faith, and you know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord instantly. It's not that any of us are looking to go in the next load, but we understand. My, my life, my soul, my eternity is fixed, and it's in Jesus Christ. There was an American doctor who says that he counted over the years of his practice 100 people that were faced with the fact that they were going to die. 100 people that he measured. And uh, these people, when they were told they were going to die, their illness was unto death. 100 of these people that he counted specifically 
said, I need to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. And they made a profession of faith, a hundred of them. But the thing that's unique about these hundred people is they all lived. And he tracked this through his practice all these years. Out of the hundred people that said, you're going to die, it's a done deal. And they made a profession of faith. Only three of them, when they finally lived and were told they were at a clean bill of health, only three of them still served the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'll tell you, folks, why is that? Because there's a repentance in the head and there's a repentance in the heart. Now, listen to what I'm getting ready to say right quick, and I'm going to be done. If your repentance and faith did not change you, then your repentance and faith did not save you. It's not real. You say, well, preacher, what are you trying to do? You're trying to get me lost this morning? Let me tell you this, if I could, you're not saved. I could throw every scripture and every possible scenario at the genuinely saved person and they would not lose their salvation. There's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. But if I can, excuse the expression, but scare the hell out of you this morning to keep you out of that place, I'll do it. Why? Because I'm going to give an account for every single person that sits under the sound of my voice this morning. And some of these messages, i got to tell you, they're not fun to preach. One of the dear brothers here a couple weeks ago, Preacher, boy, that was a hellfire and brimstone message. Little did he know what today was going to be. I want you to look at Mark 14 and verse 21. Look at this one passage of Scripture. Jesus made an unusual statement in our text here. And I believe that Judas tells us that it's possible to be associated with Jesus. I believe that he shows us that it's possible to hear gracious words. I believe that Judas shows us that it's possible to witness the wonderful works of Jesus and yet refuse him our heart's allegiance and ultimately be lost. And so Jesus makes this statement in verse number 21. He said, The Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. Now now listen here because this is an eerie thought. This morning in hell, in the flames of that fire down there, with no God and no good, just as hopeless and in despair and sin as he's ever been, is Judas. And you know what he's saying this morning? I wish I'd never been born. I wished I'd never been born. I wished I'd never existed because it's better to have never existed than to die and go to that place. The Bible says that God is long-suffering to us and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that word repentance means a, a turnaround, agreeing with God about sin, forsaking it and turning to Jesus for the free pardon of sin and forgiveness of sin. It's a, one, it's a 180 is what it is. It's, a, it's I'm walking on my path my way and you're stopped dead in your tracks when confronted with a message like this. And it's not a veering off. It's not a 90 degree. It's, you know what? I'm forsaking that and I'm turning to Jesus. And this is the path and this is the way that I'm on. Not just today because I, I'm feeling a little guilt. I'm feeling a little worried about hell and I need an insurance policy to, to make sure I don't go there. Jesus doesn't offer that. He offers forgiveness of sin and salvation for the soul and a lifetime of service to Him. Several years ago, I I read of a story, and I'll never forget it. It was about a young man and two young girls, and it's unfortunate, but they had been drinking, and they were flying at over 90 miles an hour and ran a stop sign. And they were hit by an 18-wheeler And the young man and the young woman in the front seats somehow miraculously were able to get out, but the girl in the back seat was trapped. And the car burst into flames, and and the the eyewitnesses' account of both them and those that stopped to render aid gave testimony of that girl literally being burned alive and screaming in a way that nobody would ever want to hear a sweet young lady scream. And you say, well, Pastor, why in the world would you share a story like that? Because those young people ignored the stop sign. 
And can I tell you this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ gave us the story of Judas and the Word of God because He is a stop sign on the road to hell. He enjoyed religious position. He enjoyed religious privileges. He had a religious personality. And, and he, he enjoyed religious profession. But he died and is spending all eternity in hell this morning. And he's not even there because he betrayed Jesus. He's there because he rejected Jesus. You remember Peter, the other apostle, did the same thing pretty much. Only he didn't get paid for it. In fact, he denied Jesus three times. Even cursed and, and lied to, so that he couldn't be identified at the fire with Jesus. He goes, I don't know him. The Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. But the difference between Peter and Judas is Peter was saved. But Peter was a, 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 a coward in that moment. Oh, he wouldn't be after that. Jesus, Jesus reaffirmed him three times after the resurrection on that beach front, Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter, lovest me more than these? He said, Lord, you know that I do. And he began to weep. He said, well, then feed my sheep. He didn't say you need to get resaved. He didn't say you need to go light some candles or talk to a priest. He said, then you go do what I saved you to do, to be a preacher of the gospel. And we come over, fast forward to Acts chapter 2, and what do we see... And, and Peter preaching at Pentecost and 3,000 were saved that day. That's not the case for Judas. Oh, he's preaching some messages today, but it's in hell. I wish I'd never been born. Judas is God telling us that we don't want to go to that place, my friends. And it's God telling us right now that we can stop. Stop sign means stop. And that's what Judas is. And it's God trying to tell us this morning, don't ignore the stop sign. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. I don't get very specific in the invitation always, but I'm going to ask something. I'm going to ask that nobody be looking around. And I'm going to ask that nobody leave the room. I'm going to ask for these next few moments that you'll just, if you know that you're saved and, and things are right between you and God, that you just intensely pray for somebody here this morning that needs to give their heart and life to Christ. Maybe there was a time that they thought they were saved. Maybe there was a time that they were baptized even. They were a member of a church, but their life has been anything but that which reflects the Lord Jesus. And it could very well be that they're just backslidden, but it also could very well be that they've never been saved, and they know in their heart what they need to do. One lady in a similar situation came to the pastor, and she said, you know, I, I'm, I, I prayed a prayer. I made a profession before. What if I get saved twice? He said, you can't do that. But it'd be better for you to be saved twice than lost once. And that day she was gloriously saved and her life forever changed. I'm going to pray and if you need to come and if you want to be saved this morning, it's going to be very simple. You meet Brother Bush here. If you're a lady, he's going to get you with some, one of the ladies. If you're a guy, he or one of these other men will take you to a private prayer room. And they will show you how you can be saved today in the scripture. I'm not going to embarrass you. It's not what this is about. It's that we don't want anybody to leave here without Christ this morning. So, Father in heaven, we ask, Lord, that your power would be upon this invitation, that there be no detachment from the word that's been preached, that we'd continue on, and the power of your Holy Spirit would, would continue to work. And, Lord, that this message, this stop sign that's flashing before us this morning would cause each of us to... Uh, to evaluate, to look at our lives and to know that we know that we know that we know that if we were to die today that we would go to heaven not based on our goodness, not based on our works, not based on a prayer that we prayed or a card that we signed, but based on the fact that Jesus Christ 
saved us and in the power and in the person of the Holy Spirit, He now reigns supreme and lives in our heart and our lives. And our fruit bears forth that there's a root that we know Christ because we live for Him and we serve Him. God, have Your will in Your way. Lord, maybe there's a Christian this morning. They know that relationship exists. They know that because the Holy Spirit's been, been talking to them. He's been convicting them about some adjustments that need to be made, some things they need to change, some things they need to do differently. For them this morning, it's simply to heed the voice of God. Sometimes we, we, each of us, all of us, we just have to get right with God. We just have to say, you know what, I've veered, I've strayed, and, and, and I'm coming back. Lord, I'm coming home right now. And I'm going to get back on track for you. I need your help, but I'm going to, I'm starting today, I'm going to do it. Maybe there's somebody this morning, Father, that's looking for a church. I pray that you'd add to your church the way you see fit. Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Let the invitation goes forth.